kids, students, and families are invited to join us for our next Backyard Bash, held indoors this time, on Sunday, May 19th from noon to 2.30. This will be a fun afternoon filled with food, bounce houses, and games for all ages. We want to invite you to learn about situational awareness, a training that focuses on developing awareness in everyday settings. This training will be brought to you by the Arizona Church Security Network and will focus on teaching you ways you can increase your attention to people, locations, and problems around you. Mark your calendars for this training on Saturday, June 15th from 9 to noon. More details will be coming next month. Good morning. I want you to take your Bibles or your apps, and today we're going to be finishing up John 17. So John chapter 17 is where we're going to be. If you're not familiar with where John is located, there's a graphic on the screen behind me uh, to help you navigate and, and be able to locate the book of John a little easier. So if you want to grab one of the Bibles that are in the pews and uh, follow those instructions, please feel free uh, to use those Bibles. But John 17 is where we're going to be today. Now, obviously, if you're new to our church, we've got quite the music ministry here. You know, if you look up in this setting, there's a choir, there's an orchestra. My son, my oldest son, is currently learning how to play guitar. And every time he picks up his guitar, he has to take a tuner and tune every single one of the strings of his guitar. Because they end up coming out of tune a little bit. And so the first thing he has to do before he begins practicing and playing is he has to tune that guitar to the right notes. So a guitar has six strings on it. And imagine if you were to try and strum and play the guitar and all those strings are out of tune. Is that going to be a pleasant sound coming from that guitar? Absolutely not. It's going to be hideous. It's going to be really hard to be within earshot of that guitar and not have the, the, the back of your spine just curling up. Have you ever wondered how an orchestra tunes itself? I asked one of our musicians last week. I said, how, how does an orchestra get all tuned? Because there's so many instruments and, and people playing. Like, how do they all ensure that they're tuned to the same note? And he explained to me that when an orchestra sits down and they've all gathered and they're, they're getting ready to perform, that one of two things are going to happen. Either the lead violin is going to play a perfect A, or an oboe is going to play a perfect A. And then the entire orchestra tunes itself to that one note. Because again, think about it for a moment. If an orchestra began playing and half the instruments were out of tune, would that orchestra be able to play that beautiful piece of music in a way that is pleasant to our ears? Of course not. It's going to be awful. No matter how talented and how perfectly the instrumentalists play their instrument, if the instrument's not tuned and all of the instruments tuned to one another, it's going to create a terrible sound. But when that violin or that oboe plays that perfect A and every single instrument ensures that, instrumentalist ensures that their instrument is also perfectly in tune with that one note, that makes sure that the entire orchestra is all tuned to itself. And then the orchestra can play and that sound if it's a good orchestra, that sound is going to be something of great beauty, isn't it? But the thing is, is that something has to be the point of tuning. You know, when my son tunes his guitar, he has an electronic device that helps him find the notes. With an orchestra, it is one instrument playing one note. And everybody is tuned into that one note. Today, 
in the passage that we're going to read, we're continuing through what's called the high priestly prayer that Jesus offers the night before he's betrayed and taken to the cross. And in the last section of this high priestly prayer, he prays for all of those who would come to believe in him through the work of his disciples. So he's praying for us, isn't he? And one of the things that you're going to notice, one of the things we're going to highlight in this is that the primary thing he's praying for is for unity. And it would be unity in him. As if he is that beginning perfect note that his entire church tunes itself to. So let's take this passage and let's read it today. John 17, we're going to begin in verse 20. So as you're finding John 17, 20, let me remind you what we've covered so far. So Jesus is in his last night before he's betrayed. He's having a meal with his disciples and he does a lot of really amazing stuff with them. This is the point where he washes their feet. Uh, This is the point where he points out that someone's going to betray him and Judas is uh, the one that is singled out and Judas kind of runs. He flees from this scene. Jesus, in this account, he promises and explains the coming of the Holy Spirit and why it's so great that the Holy Spirit is coming. He warns them that persecution is about to come, but then reassures them that they don't have to be concerned because he will be with them in the midst of the persecution. And then he offers this prayer. All of chapter 17 is a beautiful prayer. And the first part of this prayer, he lifts himself up and asks that he be glorified so that he can glorify the Father. Then in the second part of the prayer, he spends time praying for the disciples and for the mission that he's placed in front of them. And then we get to the third section, verse 20. Look with me now. It says this, I do not ask for these only. So he's talking about, I'm not asking just for the disciples that are sitting in the room with me right now. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22 The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So he's praying for all believers, everyone who would come to be a believer in Jesus through the work that's done by his followers after he has died, risen, and ascended into heaven. That's us, right? He's praying for you and I. He's praying for the entire church through all of time. And one of the things he lifts up here is this idea that he and the Father are perfectly one. That he's in the Father and the Father is in him. Now, we covered this a little bit two weeks ago, but Jesus is yet again reiterating that he's not just some good guy, he's not just some teacher, he's not just some prophet, he is God the Son. And he is leaving no room for any question to that. C.S. Lewis has a, an argument that he makes about who Jesus is. And he says, Jesus is either a con artist, he's either an insane man, or he's God. He can't be all three, but he claims to be God. So either he was trying to con people, or he was just clinically insane, or he is what he says he was, and he's God. Here he is making that abundantly clear that He is God. There's no in-between when it comes to the identity of who he is. In verses 22 and 23, he begins unpacking this concept of us 
as the church, and remember, the church is not a building. The church is not an event that happens on Sunday mornings. The church is the people. The church is the body of Christ, the family of God. And so he's asking that God would help them, help us, the church, to be one, to be united, just as he is one with the Father. Now, let's keep going because he's about to unpack that even further. I want to read verses 22 and 23 again, just so we've got a good idea of what he's saying. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me And loved them even as you loved me. This brings me to the main point this morning. The big idea. And I want you to think about this this week. And what it means for your life. And and the implications that it has. And the, the big idea is simply this. Unity is oneness in mission rooted in love. Unity means that we are one in mission, and that mission is rooted in the love of Jesus and love for one another. It's the commonality that holds us together as the body of Christ. I keep using that term, the body of Christ. There are lots of illustrations for the church that the New Testament gives us, but two that I think are probably the most predominantly given is the body of Christ and the family of God. So let me give you a couple of examples from Scripture about what this is talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. It says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Here in a minute, we're going to look at another scripture that talks about the body of Christ. And the body, the illustration here is that we, as the people of Christ, function like a human body. And the human body has all of these different parts. And all of those parts working together are necessary for the body to survive and to thrive. I can stand up here. And I can move around the stage and I can make hand motions to keep you interested. But what is my body doing? There are bones and joints and muscles. My heart is pumping. My lungs are working. My voice box is bringing a message out. My feet are moving around the stage. There are countless organs working in unison, in unity with one another for me to do what I'm doing up here right now. You sitting where you're sitting. You're not as moving as I am right now, but the fact that you're breathing air and you're looking and you're listening, I hope you're listening, that you're breathing the air that's around you, that your lungs are taking the air in and it's sending that oxygen through the body. There are countless organs that are right now keeping you alive. Because they work in unity with one another for your good. And that illustration is used for the church. That every single one of us, as a body of Christ, we are like the parts of the body. Each serving a vital purpose. But we must be working in unison. We must be working in unity with one another. In order for that to happen. Unity is being one with Jesus and his mission through his love. 
Jesus has given us a mission, hasn't he? You know, we word it here at our church. We word it as we exist to lead every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. We do that by loving people deeply, by sharing the gospel boldly, and by impacting the community with the hope of Jesus. That's the mission. That's why we exist. And as a church, every single one of us should be working in unity to accomplish that mission for Jesus. We are listening to his perfectly harmonized mission. He is that singular, perfect note that we perfectly align ourselves with and sing that same note in our own unique way. That's what unity is. It is living in the love that he has shown us to accomplish the mission because we belong to the body of Christ. We don't belong to the body of the body. We don't belong to the body of the pews. We don't belong to the body of 5230 North Scottsdale Road. We belong to the body of Christ for his mission, for his work. Working in perfect unison with one another because we belong to his family. Several weeks ago we talked about how we're not just part of some group, but we are literally adopted in by the perfect father. We are part of his family. I know that most of us have a certain level of dysfunction to our families, right? Some more than others. I mean, that's, that, that's to be said. But we're not talking about a dysfunctional father. We're talking about a perfect father. And, and let me just say for a moment, let me take a moment and just talk to those of you in the room that Maybe you're not a believer in Jesus. Maybe you're not part of this family of God. I'm going to be talking about a lot of things this morning. And all these things should show you the beauty of what it is to be a part of the family of God, the body of Christ. And let me just say, if you've got questions about what it is to follow Jesus, if you want to know more about why he died on a cross and rose, on the gra- rose from the grave to save you from your sins, to rescue you from the eternal condemnation and punishment that your sins put on you, if you want to know more about that, we're going to give you a couple of ways to ask those questions or to respond this morning. Um, after we take communion, celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're going to close in a kind of a closing song. And if you want to come up and pray, please, anybody's invited to come and pray during that closing worship. But if you want to know more about what it looks like to follow Jesus, uh, one of our elders, uh, Dan, is going to be right up here on this front pew, and he's there to answer those questions. And he would love to talk to you about what it looks like to be a part of the family of God. Or or come by the next steps table uh, as you leave. But please, if, if you're not a believer... If you've never placed your faith in Jesus and you want to know more about that, don't leave here today without getting those questions answered. Let us have the opportunity to talk to you about what that looks like. So, unity is oneness in mission rooted in love. Now, that's a great statement, I think, because it does encapsulate who, what we're called to be in Jesus But I do want to take a moment and say what unity is not. Because there's a lot of confusion about what unity is and what we mean when we say we are united or we should be united as the body of Christ. So first off, unity is not uniformity. I hope that you're not, we're not all going to start dressing the same and doing our hair the same so that we look and sound exactly the same. Guys, I'll be honest. If that's the striving, you're going to have to shave your head because I can't grow long hair. <laughs> and I don't think any of you in this room thinks that's a good idea. Right? And, wow. <laughs> Didn't have to affirm that so strongly. 
Ouch. But unity is not uniformity. It doesn't mean that we're all exactly the same. You know, the beauty of an orchestra is that it's made up of such a wide variety of instruments, each producing its own unique sound. It wouldn't be an orchestra if it was just trumpets, would it? While trumpets make a great sound, if you put 40 trumpets in a room, that sound's going to be pretty harsh. I'm sorry, Jabril. He's our main trumpet guy. The beauty of an orchestra is that it's wind instruments. It's brass. It's, uh, I'm trying to think, it's stringed instruments. It's all, it's percussion. It's all these different beautiful instruments coming together in unity with one another with their own unique tone to create something that it could, each of those instruments could not do on its own. That's why an orchestra works. That's why we pay money to go and listen. Well, some people pay money to go and listen to an orchestra. Because there's not anything in this world that makes a sound quite like that of an orchestra. But it's because of each instrument's unique tone. We're not designed all the same. Every single one of us in this room have our own personalities and our own giftings and talents, our own passions. And because we have all of those unique things brought together into one body, we can accomplish so much together. If everybody in this room was an administrator, this church would not function. If everybody in this room was a visionary, nothing would get done. If everybody in this room did the same thing, we could not be the body of Christ that Jesus calls us to be. Unity is not uniformity. I told you I was going to give you a passage that talked about the body of Christ. Here's that passage, 1 Corinthians 12. Verses 4 through 6. The whole chapter talks about being the body of Christ. But 4 through 6 says this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. The gifts we have. The talents, the personalities, the uniqueness of every single person in this room. That's a gift that God has given this body of Christ. It's a gift that God has given you to be a part of the body of Christ. Romans 12 verses 4 through 5 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Did you catch that last line? We are individually members one of another. We're united as a body of Christ, but not in uniformity, not looking and sounding and doing the same, but instead we're united in the same mission through the same love of our Savior Jesus. That's what unity is. It's not uniformity. When there's unity, people tend to tolerate and accept the differences that we may have. But uniformity implies that everyone is the same. We're all alike. And so there's no room for differences. Differences are an okay thing. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that we can disagree on the fundamentals of our faith. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have to believe that Jesus was a real person, that he died on a cross to save you from your sins. And on the third day, he rose from the grave in victory over sin and death. We have to agree on certain fundamentals, but there are some of the like other way out there concepts that we can agree to disagree on. We can agree to disagree on what to wear on a Sunday morning. I'm looking out in this audience and there is a wide variety of outfits today. And that's an okay thing. 
We can agree to disagree on those things that aren't fundamental because diversity is good. It does not mean that we will perfectly agree on the secondary or tertiary things of our faith. But it does mean that we agree on what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he is calling us to do as a church. That's what unity is. Let me be very clear. One of the elements of unity for a body of Christ is that the one, one of the things we agree on is where we're going as a church body. I cannot stand up here with my human body and my right leg say, I disagree with the direction that the body is going because what's going to happen? I'm not going to go anywhere without my right leg in agreement with the rest of the body. If we have a divided body, then where is that body going to go? How is it going to accomplish its mission? It's not. So unity is Agreeing on the mission. So uniform, uh, unity is not uniformity. The second one is unity is not compromising on the truth. Unity does not mean that we will compromise what God's truth says. We will not compromise on the definition of sin or the definition of righteousness. We will not compromise on how a person achieves, comes to salvation. Because the only way that a person can be rescued from their sins is through belief in Jesus. We will not compromise on that truth. That's not what unity means. We will not compromise the truth of Jesus. That's not what unity is. And thirdly, unity is not cowardice. Unity is not cowardice. We will not avoid difficult conversations because we're di- we don't want to be uncomfortable. This library of direction for our lives is filled with some uncomfortable truth. And the fact of the matter is, is we don't avoid that. We also don't avoid holding each other accountable and coming to one another and lifting each other up and sacrificing time and resources to build one another up in the body of Christ. Unity is courage, it's not cowardice. So, we're called to do a lot. And you may be asking, why are we having such a passion, not we, why am I being so passionate about this? Let me just call this out. Why am I making such a thing about this? Because we are in one of the most divisive seasons that Americans see. We're in a political election year And if we know anything from 2020, there's nothing quite as divisive as politics. And the hard part is, is that we saw in 2020, a lot of churches lose their unity because people got more obsessed about politics than they did about their savior. And let me be very clear. We, as this church body, will value unity over all. Don't misunderstand me. There's a place for politics. But if you're willing to disassociate with the body of Christ, if you're willing to break your unity and cause divisions in the body over your politics, that is unbiblical. It is not okay. Paul and Peter And James and countless others through the New Testament condemn it as a great sin. We will not do that this election year. We as people of Christ can agree to disagree on politics. Believe me, there are people sitting in this room right now from every point of the political spectrum. And we can sit here together because we're not united by a political party We're united by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so, so why am I hounding on this? I want us to right now, before it starts getting ugly in the world around us, I want us to right now to consciously say, I will not allow 
anything to cause divisions between me and my body of Christ. No matter what it is, politics, whatever, I don't care what it is, but unity in the body of Christ should be the number one priority because Jesus says it's the number one priority. You want to know where he says that? John 13, 35. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When we divide ourselves over non-biblical things, that's not loving one another, is it? And I want you to notice what he does not say. This is Jesus speaking. He does not say, you will know, they will know you are my disciples by your theology. He doesn't say that, does he? Does he say, you'll know, they will know you're my disciples by who you vote for? No. He says that they will know you are my disciples because we, as the body of Christ, are loving one another in a unity that goes beyond all of those worldly things. That we are united together because we have a singular mission that is given to us through the love of Jesus. That's what we exist for. You see, when united, an orchestra can play the most beautiful music that's ever been created. But if that orchestra, if even a few members of that orchestra decides that they don't want to be united in tune or rhythm, then it's going to destroy the whole musical piece. It's going to destroy the mission that that orchestra is trying to achieve by playing that piece of music. And the church is the same. We are tuned to the singular love and mission of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean that we're all exactly the same. It means it's okay to be diverse and different and have different opinions on things. That's okay as long as we are singularly united on Jesus. Jesus is what truly matters in this season. Let's conclude. Look with me in verse 24. Verse 24, so chapter 17, verse 24, it says this. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Our mission is an eternal mission. Our mission isn't about our comfort on this earth or getting the way we want things to run. Our mission has nothing to do with us here. Our mission has to be about eternity and leading every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus that leads to eternal life, not eternal death. That's what we're here for. And Jesus promises that we will be reunited with him if we live in him. We will be with Jesus. But until then, we've got a mission. We've got a mandate. We've got a job to do on this earth. So let me ask the question. How can you work towards the unity of the body of Christ? Again, it's not meaning that you agree with everything. It means that you're on mission through the love that Jesus has given to you. What do you need to do to be in unity? Maybe another question is what's getting in the way of that oneness that Jesus calls us all to. Let's go to the Lord. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are, for how you love us. Lord, we thank you that just as you and the Father are one, Jesus, you call us to that same unity. Unity with one another as the body of Christ. So Lord, We pray that you'd help us with that. Our sinful desires, our worldly temptations are to be divided. To make 
not important things bigger than they are, forgetting that we're called to unity in you. So Lord, help us to recognize that. Help us to learn how to agree to disagree. Help us to learn how to have conversations without breaking fellowship with one another. And instead, to value the mission that you've given us over everything. We thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.